As we were praying this morning, we began to feel the presence of the Lord. God's got a message for us today. He's got a word for us. And I pray you just open up your hearts and receive what God has for you. We've been talking about being prepared. Prepared for what? For what's coming. This message is a prophetic message. It's talking to you about the future and things that are coming into the body of Christ. And he's talking about a habitation. The scripture speaks about us being uh, living in him and he living in us. And we have understood that we need more of God. Is that correct? How many want more of the Lord? Raise your hand. All right, so I, I, we want more of God, and God is saying that He wants more of us. He's coming back for a church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. He's coming back for a church that's looking for Him. He's coming back for a church that is full of faith. And He said, if you're looking for Him when He returns, you will see Him. So we're looking for Him. We want to see that habitation. I'm going to take a look at John 15, verse 7. He says, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will... And it shall come to pass. If his word abide, he is the word. Jesus is the word. If it buys into you, how many of you has got something you'd like to see changed in your life? You'd like to see some changes. Well, right here's the way to do it. <laughs> abide in him and his word abide in you. And you ask what you will. Jesus is the word. So as many changes come into the body of Christ... John chapter 16, verse 13. How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, and that shall He speak. And He will show you things to come. He says here He's going to guide you, but He's going to guide you into truth. He also says here He's going to show you things to come. In the New Living Translation, that last part of the verse says, And He will tell you about the future. And this comes by the Spirit of the Lord. I want you to take a look at this statement here, and then we're going to pray. So God wants to prepare you for a greater habitation by telling you what is coming. He does this through the Holy Spirit and prophecy, telling you the future. This will encourage you, cause your faith to rise, and increase your expectations, and prepare you for a greater habitation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come here this morning. We thank you for the fullness of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the habitation, God. We thank you for your perfect will being done. I ask you to God to touch in this message. Lord, that our hearts and minds are open. I take authority over every hindrance, every distraction in Jesus' name. And I declare an open heaven here today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we receive of you today, and I pray, God, that not one person will leave here the same. That we'd all be changed and transformed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of the things you're going to see is prosperity, healing, blessings will be coming into the church. In Psalms 105, verse 37, He brought them forth also with silver and gold, And there was not one feeble person among them. Now, we talked about this last week. We're going to go through this pretty quickly here, kind of review just a little bit. But understand that there's a parallel between the children of Israel coming out of bondage and and, uh, coming into that liberty and freedom and and inheriting the inheritance. And it's based upon the, the covenant promises of God in that Abrahamic covenant to the children of God. We see that same parallel today happening in the body of Christ in the time that we're living now. But we are living under a better covenant. We're living under a covenant with better promises. And this covenant that we have today is uh, a covenant that cannot be broken. It's a covenant made by Jesus Christ uh, with the Father on our behalf. And God said at one point that He would pour out His Spirit... Upon all flesh. And he began to do that a few thousand years ago. He began to pour out his spirit, the Holy Spirit. And they began to be filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And from that time until now. But then he said it went, then he also went on to prophesy in several places in the, in the scriptures. That his glory will fill the earth. 
the glory of the Lord. He's, and he swore by himself, no other, nothing higher than himself to swear by. And he swore by himself that his glory would fill the earth. And not only that, but the knowledge of his glory would fill the earth. And he tells us here in, in, then in verse Exodus 23, verse 25. It says, and, he shall, and you shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. That's why we're going to be taking a look at this again over the next few weeks, and taking a look at healing, because he has promised that. But he said he's promised that to a certain people. And that's the people that says here in this first part of the verse that it will serve him. And as we serve him, and as he tells us that we obey him, these are the blessings of God that begin to come forth. Jehovah Rapha is his name. He's the self-existent one. He is the I Am. And, his, his, uh, and, and the Rapha means uh, to heal, restore to normal and to mend. And we understand and realize that sickness is not normal. So God came to heal. And it's, it's, it's abnormal. So what we've got to do is stop accepting it. And one of the ways that we could stop accepting it is that we have to get out of the habit of looking to the medicine bottle or the supplement or the doctor or Google and Internet and trying to find out what to do, but go first to the Lord Jesus Christ. For He is the healer. He is the deliverer. And then, now, there's a pattern that's here, and there's a stronghold that I want to deal with right at this moment. And that stronghold is a stronghold of sickness that's in the body of Christ. And this is not the will of God. So what we must do, anytime we find a stronghold that we're anything that we need to be delivered from, anything that we're bound by, there is a reason why we've been bound by it. And there's a reason, and, mo- and the reason is some kind of disobedience. And the disobedience most of the time is a lack of being in the Word and lack of prayer. But then there's other disobedience. There's other things. But, and then we get into a habit pattern and the enemy begins to hold and possess. And here's what God is saying here today. He says, now, you want, you want to break that pattern in your life, one of the first things we need to do is repent. And you say, repent. Here we go, repentance and, and, and talking about sin. No, I'm talking about what the word repent means. Repent means to change your mind. When God said, I'll do this for you, or I'll do this for you, but, and if you'll do this, then I will repent of the judgment or the evil that was to come upon you. That means I'll change my mind, and I'll stop it from happening. But see, we sow things, and it causes it to happen, and uh, and, and that's what the cause. God is not the author. He's not the author of the destruction. He's not author of, of all that and sickness. He's not the author of those things. So somewhere along the way, we need to go before God and repent. Lord, I repent of allowing sickness in my life. I repent of not meditating in the Word. I repent of prayer. I repent of accepting the sickness and say, K, say, Ra, whatever will be, will be. I'm old, and that's what the way it's supposed to be. No, it's not. Amen. Not at all. So this is what we have to do is begin to uh, take authority over it, confess it, then in Ezekiel 23, 24, he says, Thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do their works. But thou shalt utterly throw, overthrow them and quite break down their images. We're gonna, not going to bow down to their gods, not serve them, not do any of the works. And there's so many things that we could talk about. But what we're going to talk about right at the moment is there is a move of holiness. There is a move of purity and singleness of heart toward God, toward the true God. And that's what God is bringing back into his, his church. He told us in, in, in the book of Deuteronomy that he is a faithful God, that he's a covenant-keeping God to a thousand generations. He promises there that he would love us, bless us, multiply us, and he would bless above all people and will take away from thee all sickness. These are some of the promises he gave them as they come out of Egyptian bondage. And in Hebrew 8, verse 6, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is a mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. We are a part of the Abrahamic covenant. We are a part of, we have all the blessings of the old covenant. We've been engrafted in, and we're a part of all of it. And, and that's why he says it's a better covenant, and, and, a, and with better promises, we got all that and a whole lot more. That's something you can shout about. 
But one of the things, when we, we got here last week, and it says you will see great victories and deliverances on every level. Socially, governmental-wise, in the church, and every aspect of the church. God said he'll be an enemy to our enemy. He'll be an adversary to our adversary. But he also said in Ezekiel 23, verse 27, I will send my fear before you and will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come, and I will make all thine enemies turn their backs unto thee. Going to make them run. They're going to go in the other direction. I talked to you about an outpouring that took place called the transformation that took place in, in a town of 30,000 people in, in South America some years ago. And God began to bless them. They became prosperous. Uh, supernaturally, the ground was watered up and uh, water came up from the ground and, and, fertilized, and, and their crops and they became wealthy and, and they, they kicked out the witchcraft. They, kicked, they, they threw out the other gods uh, and God began to move through the city. And one of the things that began to happen, they, they shut down all the, all the jails. And the reason they shut down all the jails is because nobody, they didn't need them anymore. They end up become churches. They did keep one, uh, they did keep one poli uh, police officer. That was the chief of police. They, they liked him, so they kept him and paid him. You talk about defunding the police. This is a good way to do it. All right? So, uh, uh, also, you know, the bars had closed up w before the jails did. Uh, they quit going to the bars, and, uh, and the businesses changed their names uh, to Christian names. And, and guess what? In the schools, they were teaching God. They were teaching the Word of God. And guess what? There were no laws against it. No laws at all against it. And we're talking about a transformation that's coming. We're talking about what God's doing today and what He's bringing forth today. As more and more serve the one true God, we will see a transformation that will cause multitudes to be delivered from every type of bondages. And there were many bondages that they had that God began to set them free of before they began to see those great and mighty blessings. One of the things that happened, uh, several things happened. I'm going to share a few things with you at this point. A few years ago, one of the uh, pastors in town that I'm friend with, and we were talking, and I told him a few of my stories, and then a little while later, he calls me up and said, I want you to come over and preach. I want you to come and speak. He said, we're, we're, we're talking about uh, demonic possession. We're talking about deliverance. And I, I want you to come and tell your stories. He knew I was a storyteller. He said, I want you to come. Well, I, I, I laid all this stuff out, ready to go, and I got there. And uh, they turned to me and said, you have one hour and 50 minutes. <laughs> you have one hour and 50 minutes, and then, 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 you, then you need to stop. <laughs> so I said, great. And you know, I never got through those notes. But I titled it, Lessons Learned from Demons and Devils. Something you may not realize, but long time ago when this church was first started and before we had, had stationery, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I didn't know what to call it. I just knew I was going to serve God. Do what I but this church was named Faith Deliverance Center for a while. And deliverance is something that God has used me in quite a bit over the years. And this is something that you're going to see coming back into the, into the body of Christ on a greater multitude than ever before. There are more people than ever before today that needs deliverance from demonic activity in their lives. So uh, one, one of the things I was talking about, and, and most of that hour and 50 minutes was like one story after another. And then a little, little bit of what, what we learned from that. But, you know, some of the things that happened from people who were set free, some of the names of these spirits, uh, uh, we, we, we were taking authority over spirits from Mommy to the Great White Buffalo. Yeah, Mommy was one of the names of the spirit that a person got set free from. And that Great White Buffalo, that was an interesting one. I was ministering to a Native American, and uh, we had our office in the house and, and uh, had him there and talked to him for a little bit. And, and, uh, you know, and, and in that conversation, he's, uh, I asked about other religions and stuff. He said, well, the, the great white buffalo, but that's just another name for Jesus. And I said, well, sure, fine, okay. You know, and I, I'm not so sure about that one. But I began to minister and pray for him. And the Holy Spirit says, take authority over the great white buffalo. I said, okay. So I took authority over the great white buffalo. At that moment, man, he looked up at me, all this rage, but he fell out of his chair and he slimbered across the floor like a snake. And then he was set free. 
Then he was delivered. You see, Jesus set the captive free. Some people are afraid of this subject. Some people, but God wants to set people free. And so many things happen that uh, begin to happen. And, and sometime later, I was preaching on one a Sunday morning and, and just regular service. I thought, I don't remember what I preached on. But when I went home, the phone began to ring. I need to come and see you. And for about four days, three or four days, people began to come. And they were coming to the house and, and uh, they were being set free. There were all kinds of things. And this is from the congregation. This is from people who love God. And, you know, they weren't possessed, but they were influenced. They were things that have attached to them that caused them problems. And they were coming in. And at one point, I was, I was in, in the office ministering to somebody. Brenda was in the kitchen ministering to, a, to another lady because they were just coming from everywhere. And the doorbell rang, and I ignored it. I hope they'll go away. And the doorbell rang again. So I went to the doorbell and uh, uh, to the door, and I opened the door, and they says, I, Pastor, I need to see you. I said, oh, well, well that's good. I, I need, uh, um, uh, let's set up an appointment. I've, I've got some people. And, and, and her, the voice changed and says, you don't understand. I said, okay, yeah, I got it. Come on in. Come on in. Go, down to, go downstairs to the, to the family room, and Brenda and I will be down there in just, just a little bit. Well, it finished up with uh, uh, what we were doing, and we went down, and she was so miraculously set free. And her life has been changed. She's had a beautiful life. Even today, it's just a joy of the Lord to talk to her. Uh, just a, a transformation that began to take place. After a few days went by, God began to show me other things that were going on. And, 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 and someone gave me a call and about Wednesday and said, Hey, Pastor, I've got to come and see you. There's something wrong. I said, Yeah, I know. I said, God's got a word for you. He said, He does. I said, Yeah, come on. And I, I talk with him, and he is involved. Now, I want to tell you this because you need to learn from this. One of the things he had been involved with was church. That had, ended up being a problem. He was in, involved with a ministry that, was, that believed every, what we believe. I mean, they're Christian. They believed all, all these, you know. And, and not, not such a big problem, you know. But the Lord spoke to me and told me to tell him that he had to repent of being involved in a, a cult. And he goes, what? I said, yeah, you don't understand, but God said, God said you have to do that. He said, but I love those people. I said, I know. I'm not talking about denouncing the people. I'm not talking about because they taught the word. But they got off on something. And they got off on a tangent. Now, how did I know this? He told me <laughs> as we talked about it. But they began to get into pride. And they got into pride to the place where they thought they, they were the it. They were the only ones. And because of that mindset, stronghold, that the enemy was able to bring in, it brought in a religious spirit of bondage unto the people, and that God began to look at it as nothing more than a cult. But God set him free. The next day, he drove up in the driveway and came to the door, him and his wife, he said, and I'm going, oh boy, got to do some more. I said, what's going on? And he goes... He said, it's like night and day. He said, the difference is like night and day. This, this guy, was a, he was a man of God. He loved God. God's bringing deliverance to the church. And he's bringing deliverances in our lives. And there have been so much demonic influence that have been put into and received into people's lives that God is going to set free. He's going to use a covenant people, which we are, with great deliverances. And that will be the norm. The devil will tremble at God's people. And that's already begun. Why has that begun? Because there's a transformation that has already begun in the house of God. I, I want to share something that God was doing me there on the front seat, but... I could hardly think of it without crying. I began to see again and again. I saw this place filled. It's been filled before. I saw it filled and I began to... And the high praises of God coming forth. The glory of God filling this place. And I began to feel the intensity of God. 
and I was reminded of some of the great and wonderful times that I've had here in this building right here when it's been full of people. God said, we've come to the end of this time of testing and trying. And you shall see it again, church. You're going to see it again. But he began to enlighten me and he says, this is when the deliverances truly begin to take place. When you see God's people come together. This is why the enemy has come against the church to stop the church from being and gathering together. This is why there, there, there's so many churches and pastors I speak to and says our people haven't come back yet. And I can't get into all that. There's so many different reasons. But one of the things that God is delivering us from is lukewarmness. And lukewarmness is going out. Hallelujah. And we're having our focus on God once again greater than ever before and that's what's going to bring us to the next thing that we're going to begin to see. And that's a great harvest is coming. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 11. And they shall not speak every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. They're all going to know me. Now all these examples that I've been talking about. Even those that happened uh, on those transformation videos and things in that city. And, and things that have happened in this church. It all comes. There's, some, there's a common thread and that is prayer. And the prayer increases. And you're going to see a move of God. Of, of prayer. And it's going to become more and more the norm. And where God is, where the enemy has robbed you and circumstances have robbed you of your time of prayer, God's going to be restoring that. And you're going to be wanting to pray more than you are going to want to watch TV or some other kind of entertainment or temporary pleasures. God's going to bring you forth with that. And He's going to begin to use you and and just your prayers alone. We're going to begin to reap a mighty harvest. In California, where I used to live, there's a highway called Highway 99. At one point, he had the distinction of being the most uh, uh, drunk drivers in a section of highway in America. And then a little bit later on, there were several cities like along there was uh, Modesto and uh, Fair, uh, Bakersfield, Fr- Fresno, and some of those that were there. Those cities were uh, voted the most miserable cities uh, in America. And now this is a pretty, pretty dismal place. And this was some time ago. But uh, let's see, this was Mary O. Murillo had a vision. And in this vision, God lifted him up and, and he could see that highway. And all of a sudden, it turned into a river. And God spoke to him and says, This is a river of my glory. He had no idea what God was going to do. But a few years later, an outpouring of God began to take place and began to take and 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 began to minister in each of those cities, an outpouring of God. And also in Sacramento at the uh, at one of the universities there, an outpouring of God began began to take place along that highway to the point where people are driving down the highway. And you've heard these stories before, but they would just feel the convicting power of God, and they would get off of that exit and they'd go to one of the churches where they'd never been before and go in and get set free, get delivered, or get saved, whatever the case might be, or get healed. All those those things were, were, were the things that were happening. And one day, one of the testimonies is a young man driving a truck. Down, and he, he, he became a truck driver. And he used to be a youth pastor. And he got discouraged in his life because of the, the, the problems of his leadership that had fallen into sin. And he just walked away from church. And he was driving down the road and he called his mom and he said, Mom, something's going on. Something's happening with me. God's doing something. She says, where are you? He says, I'm on Highway 99. She said, don't you know about the outpouring that's happening all around there? And he goes, Mom, I'm getting a a word from God. He said, I'm getting a prophetic word. And he says, Mom, it's true. It's true. The, the outpouring is true. And he said, I'm getting this word. God is just telling me that the greatest revival California has ever seen is, is, is coming and is about to take place. You're going to see things that you've never seen before and beyond what you could ever imagine. These are just some of the stories to tell you, to tell you about, to get you excited. 
to get you understanding, believing, and knowing that God is moving. 500, right now, 500 pastors, ministers, are gathering together to plan an evangelistic attack against New York <laughs> to go in and reap the harvest. There are evangelistic mass meetings that have taken place even in California recently. And people, the masses are beginning to come to Christ. You know, I love hearing about these things because I get to talk about them. But I love hearing these things because it encourages me. This is what God is doing. It's what He's moving. He is raising up, once again, what, I could, what, what the evangelistic anointing. At one point, I began to pray in, in, in this church, and I, I could see, you know, there's the five-fold ministry gifts. There's the, there's the apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist. And, uh, and I could see all these ministries in operation. But I began to see a lack in the area of the evangelists. Yeah, they were traveling evangelists, but God had put these in the church, and it's to be in the local church. And I said, where's the evangelist of the church? Where's my evangelist <laughs> in my church? And we begin to pray, and I begin to tell others, we're going to pray, and we're praying, and God's getting ready to answer those prayers. There's evangelists in this church. You have an evangelistic anointing, and it's not an anointing to go travel and get behind the pulpit, but it's an evangelist anointing that would cause you to go out here somewhere and to, and to run into people and to talk to people. I know a guy out in California when I lived there in the church, uh, and he tells a testimony in his life. He said, he said, I could always tell when God wanted to save somebody from hell. He said, I would begin to smell burning flesh. He would begin to smell that. He said, he pulls up the gas station, he begins to smell it, and the attendant comes out. And uh, this is when they used to put the gas in for you. It's been a while. But anyway, they came out, and he said... Uh, he just began to talk to him about the Lord. And the guy got saved right there. God got set him free right there. The evangelic anointing coming to the body of Christ. Get ready. Those of you that have it in your heart, it's going to begin to come forth. Now, church, you've heard this. You've heard God talk about this in this church. He's prophesied it to you. He spoke to you about it. Connie, you've heard it and seen it. God bless you. You were here last week. She hadn't been able to be with us. She's our lead intercessor, and, and, uh, but she's, she's with us here today. And I thank God for her and the prayers that she prays for you. She prays for you every day, every day. Amen. And anytime we got prayer, we send them over all week. And then uh, all your prayer requests, and she's praying, and we're praying with her and believing. And God is answering prayers. The evangelistic anointing. And for those of you, one of the things that God wants to do here today, and God has prophesied over you, He has spoken to you, He has spoken to you words about uh, revival or about salvations, and, and you know God is going to bring it to pass. Be encouraged today. Receive that. God wants to restore that. It's one of the things we're going to pray about later. God's going to be restoring that. Something else you're going to begin to see in the time ahead. You will see lies and deceptions replaced with truth. Lies and deceptions replaced with truth. This is one of the greatest hindrances of the habitation of God and the move of God. The, the, the Lord tells us in John 8, 32, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You can't get free unless you have the truth. Church, you've been lied to. I've been lied to. We've been lied to by the government. We've been lied to by our news broadcast. We've been lied. Uh, people are being lied to in churches. But what you're going to see on every level... The truth's coming forth in the church, in society, in the government, in the newsroom, and foremost of all, in our hearts. Every truth a lie is re re rooted in a, a thought process. The devil begins to deceive with a half-truth or a flat-out lie. He used to use a lot of half-truths. Nowadays, it's just plain old flat-out lies, it seems like. And it gets the masses to begin to believe. And, and, and one, of the, one, of the, one of the things that... Government and, and, and people in charge of countries that want to try to take over countries. Uh, one of the things they're taught is you tell a lie long enough and, and they'll believe it. You just keep telling the lie long enough and they'll believe it. So, uh, just give you an example. You could probably think of a lot of examples 
that, we've, that we have been lied to about over the news media and by the government and so forth, and we've heard, and, and, and it's totally different today. But I'm going to tell you about one that's still believed today by some people, a lie. You see, over 2,000 years ago, there was a wonderful event that took place around 2,000 years ago. A man called Jesus was raised from the dead. The resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ. And I could just imagine it something like this, a conversation going on back then. So let me just do a little conversation from back then. Hey, hey buddy, did you, did you, hear, about, did you hear about that guy that they crucified uh, uh, and rose from the dead? I believe they call him Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard about him. I heard about that. That's not true. That's just conspiracy theory, you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, I said, well, well, I'm not so sure about that. Well, you know, the guards of the soldiers, they said, the, you know, they said they came and uh, the disciples came and took his body and stole his body in the middle of the night. And, and, and not only that, you know, that's the official government position. And, uh, and besides that, I heard it on the news. Well, I'm not so convinced. I'm going to go find me one of those soldiers, one of those guards. Hey, Roman soldier. I understand you're one of those that uh, was there guarding the tomb that night when that man uh, called Jesus was supposed to have raised from the dead. He said, yes, I was there. What's your name? Anonymous. Anonymous who? Anonymous whistleblower. He said, <laughs> he said yeah, I was there. You know, I said, you know, that, that, the light came in. All of a sudden, it was so dark, but the light came in. It was so bright, I could hardly see. And, and I, I, I could see that stone. That stone rolled away of own, own accord. I was so scared. I was scared out of my, my britches. He said, uh, and I couldn't move. And, and uh, I, I don't really know what happened after that. All I know is that as soon as I could move, I ran from there as fast as I could. And, and me and the rest of the guys, uh, the soldiers, we went to the priest and we told them all that we heard. And they said, they said well, uh, uh, what they did was they gave us all this money. And they gave us this money and told us to say that the disciples came in the nighttime and stole his body away. Let's take a look at Matthew 28, 12 through 13. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying... Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were slept. <laughs> Do you know some people still today believe that he did not raise from the dead and his body was stolen? They still believe it. You think, well, how can they, you know? Well, they don't know Christ for one. Did you realize in a late, one of the latest polls that taken place in America just, just a few weeks ago, 80%, 80% of the population of America do not trust or believe the government, do not trust or believe the news. I wonder why. Well, okay. <laughs> it's, it, duh, no wonder. So many things. He says, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. God is beginning to reveal, and He was going to reveal it. He's going to use whistleblowers. He's going to use all kinds of things. Just great, hold on. Something else that began to come across our way, and that's woke. Being woke and wokeness and all that. Do you know that woke, when it first started, I understand this, that, that you know, 20 years ago was something good. Start out with something good and for people to, 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 to be proud of who you are in a good way and, and uh, not to look down yourself as a second-class citizen, that kind of thing. But, of course, a good thing had been, has been twisted and made bad. So many good things start out that way and they end up being bad and turned into bad, taken over. The enemy begins to take, take it over. Uh, I was reading a, 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 an article about one of the colleges recently and uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and they, they put down this whole list, like, like 50 more names and phrases or whatever that's now canceled, taboo, whatever. I don't remember any of them but one. And there was one there, and it was grandfather. And I went, oh, my goodness. I said, you know, I'm an old white man. That was bad enough. Now it's grandfather added to it. And I got eight times over on that one. So... You know, it's cancel culture. Why is all this going on? What's it about? It's all about one, it's all the major thing it's about is offense. That's why Pastor TJ taught us about offense and getting out of offense. 
because an offended person is is uh, they cannot see clearly. Brenda and I had done a lot of marriage counseling. One of the things we do is in marriage counseling people, and that was uh, in marriage counseling, and, and, and offense was always uh, the big issue within the relationship. And when we got through that and we got to the place to deal with it, then the marriage could be put together. But one of the things that began to happen was, and, and this is a, I see this happen over and over and over. And, and, as, and I saw it a lot with people who had been uh, uh, divorced and then remarried. And one of the spouses would be treating their current spouse and blaming them and saying they're doing this and that when they weren't. But it was the first spouse that they were actually, and did not, they were deceived to that point. So that they, because of offense, they began to put their offense on another person. And this is one of the major tactics of the enemy. And then they begin to can't see clearly. They become confused. And they can be deceived. They can be manipulated. They can be controlled. All these kind of things. And we see the same thing happening in society and the, the mass. Trying to do that uh, across society as a whole. So how do you get free of this racism? I'm going to erase him. We ain't got there yet. Okay. <laughs> so he uses this to deceive many. What they had to do was to forgive. They had to forgive and get set free. And racism is another one that begins to happen. Racism is used as a political tool to bring division in our nation. You see, a house divided cannot stand. And they know that if it can bring chaos and division, they can take more and more control and even take over a nation. As I said last week, there's so many that hate this nation that's in our government that doesn't want to see us stand. They want, they're a part of the globalist, they're a part of the one world agenda, which you can even read about in the Bible. This is what they're about. So... Again, with racism, it's the same thing that begins to happen. How do you get free of racism? Same way you get free of offense. Because it is an offense. You have to forgive. And then you begin to see free, freely free. You begin to think clearer. Begin to see clearer. You forgive. I don't mean you, you accept it. I don't mean you, stop, you don't stop fighting it. You don't do any of those things. But you don't allow it to, to, to affect you to the point where you are living in offense and then the enemy then has a doorway into your life. There's so many more lies that we could talk about. The, there's an exerted attempt against our children in the school system uh, and in our society. You know, there, there, I don't care how many genders you might think there is. There's really only two, man and woman. There's only two, male and female. That's it. Uh, and, you know, they, they've got all this stuff going on in the bathrooms and all these kind of problems that's going on. But the, and, it, and it, it, again, brings about offense, and that's what it's designed for. Wokeness has flooded every institution in America. The Christian gospel is the only thing that will restore America because America was built upon the gospel. All this wokeness that we're hearing and seeing is a counterfeit wokeness. The true wokeness <laughs> or awakening is the awakening of the Lord Jesus Christ that's beginning to take place. And that, and that false, uh, false fake uh, wokeness that has come through, it has not produced anything positive. But what you're going to see, and the people are getting tired of that, you're going to see the coming, the, the principles of the, of, of the Bible, the principles of the good things of the Word of God, the truths that are in the Word of God begin to take place. Uh, take over that flood and overthrow it. So what do I do? In all of this, what do I do? Look in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You've got to keep your heart, and you've got to be diligent about it. More so today than ever before. But all of this is bombarding us in every direction. And cause so much depression, oppression, and, and, and just weight upon us. We, we have to guard our heart with all diligence. And we do that by casting down those imaginations in our mind. We have to take authority over the thoughts again and again. How do you get healed? Same thing. Take authority over those thoughts. How do you get delivered? Take authority over those thoughts. 
Don't let it get into your heart because if you, whatever you meditate on, whatever you're concentrating on, what the thing is you can't wait to get involved with or go do, that's what those thoughts came first, then it got in your heart, and then it begins to act. It becomes actions in your life. Romans 12, 1 and 2. You say, well, uh, this is Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove the good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. You see, you see, church, you say, well, hey, I've seen that verse a hundred times. I've seen it a thousand times. Uh, and I've had to use it again and again and again. The question is, are you doing it? Are you literally casting down those imaginations and all those high things? Because if you want to walk in the perfect will of God, uh, the perfect will of God is the blessings of the Lord, the prosperity of God. When you walk in that perfect will of God, it is good, acceptable, and perfect. He doesn't have a permissive will. He's got one will, and it's a blessed will, a people that is healed set free, delivered. It is a people that has, have joy in their life and a smile on their face and they're walking in faith and believing in faith and their glass is overflowing with the presence and the, and the Spirit of God. And this is the will of the Lord. And this right here is like a piece of armor that you need to have on. It's like the breastplate of righteousness that you have. I, can you imagine going into warfare without that bulletproof vest on? They hand you, I don't feel like it today. Well, you better get that thing on and cast down those imaginations bring it into captivity and and do the will and and just watch the will of God begin to take place in your life the will of God in your life is so much greater than you can imagine greater than what you could think that you would ever want or desire there's more satisfaction more fulfillment in that will of God so as you begin to do these things then God will begin to perform in your life the, the covenant promises of God. Exodus chapter 8, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. God wants you to, be, to worship God in spirit and truth. Not pressed down, not oppressed, not weighed down, none of those kind of things. He wants you to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And the Lord is saying today, let my people go. Not just from uh, uh, government oppression, or, uh, but, but from all the demonic oppression, from all the uh, opposition to the enemy that He's got into and began to control and, and move in our society to set us free. It's time to rise up in faith and speak those things which are not as though they were. It's a supernatural God, a move of God that's taking place, a sovereign move of God, a habitation of the Lord. Offer yourself as a, that living sacrifice to be filled with that habitation of God like never before. You've got a decision here to make. You can't, your relationship with God can't be a one-night stand. It can't be once-a-week stand or, a, or just a casual friend. Look at this next statement. The Holy Spirit has got to be the engine that drives your faith. He has got to be the force behind your choices. Let that sink in. How often do you acknowledge God? Do you acknowledge Him every day? Do you have a prayer unto Him? Do you, is it every, or, or do you let a day go by or two days go by? And not acknowledging Him at all. That's very, 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 very dangerous. You know what that's called? That's called lukewarm. And God is going to bring us out of that. And we need to be acknowledging God on a daily basis. Be in His presence at all times. He working with us that drives our life. And He's the force behind all of our choices. Christianity is now front and center. Christianity is now becoming front and center more so than ever before in, in our nation. You see it happening in the public schools, in the school system. Christians are rising up and they're t declaring the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ without saying, thus saith the Lord. They're claim, claiming the uh, pure principles that are in the word of God and declaring a victory in it. And declaring they didn't, we're fed up with it. We're tired of it. And the nation is coming across the nation. And the church is now front and center. We either got to get involved. We need to be getting involved. Or, you know, whatever happens won't be that good. Uh, in our own lives personally. 
We need something, you know, we don't just need miracles and healings, but we need the daily proof of the power of God in our emotions, in our honesty, in our integrity, in the wisdom of God, because we need that more than ever so that we can navigate this complicated road map that has, uh, for every Christian family that America has ever known. How can we know if we're in faith? Take a look at this. Are we in faith? Doubt despairs. Doubt complains. Doubt is sad. Faith rejoices, gives thanks, and is glad. Question is, are you in despair? Are you complaining? Lord, I repent. Okay. <laughs> I need to repent. Yes, yeah, sometimes I'm in doubt. Sometimes I'm complaining. But it's time for a transformation to walk into faith. In the midst of all the opposition, rejoice, give thanks, and be glad. Look at this next statement. The attention of the world is turning to the true church. The harvest will be looking at you because of your life in Christ. They will come to Christ. This is why we're giving these messages right now. This is why we're talking about this. Because there's a harvest that's on God's soul. And this is something God wants more than ever before. And if you will, if you, and when what God wants you to do here is, uh, is to grab a hold of this and let your life shine so to the place that others may truly see the true and living God in your own life. Church, this is what you've been waiting for. This is what has been in your heart for years. This is the things that's been prophesied over you for years. Romans 8, 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature eagerly awaits for the revelation of the sons of God. God is birthing something new, church. He's birthing something new right now. Right now. And I pray to God that your eyes are open and your heart is open to receive what God is doing now. It's not going to be the same. It's never going to be the same. And you don't want it to be the same. He's birthing something new and it's not comfortable. It's a time of travail. It's taking place in your life. It's not comfortable. The earth is groaning and waiting for us to appear. Again, this is why God's been prophesying to us. This is why we're teaching about a habitation. And I pray here this morning once again that you grab hold of what's being said here today. I want everybody to stand. This time... And this word, and this purpose for this word, again, is to get our attention. And I need God to get my attention. I desire to see all that we've talked about. And I pray that you want to be a part of seeing that happen here in this church. We have many out today. Some are in the hospital. Some are here and there. Some just hadn't come back yet. We want to pray here this morning as they listen to this message that they'll be touched by God and dare, dare to go and seek Him in a, in a new expectation. To seek after Him. This morning I want to pray and I want to pray for all of you, but I want to pray specifically first for you who have heard in your life God speak to you by the Spirit. It might have been by a prophetic word. A lot of times when you receive a prophetic word, God's already spoken it to you in your spirit. The Lord is just reinforcing that. Because, you know, the Scripture said you have no need of the teacher. you got the Holy Spirit. He'll lead you into all truth. So even if we didn't have a prophet, it didn't matter. We got the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's going to teach us. So we need to open up, and, and, and where the Spirit has spoken to you, where He has dealt with you, where He has brought you a vision or, or, or something in your life that you, you want to see take place, that you're waiting for it to take place. You're waiting for the circumstances of it to come together. God wants to renew that in you right here this morning. So I'm going to pray for you. First of all, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But then after that, we're going to open the altar up of anybody else that wants to come. This morning, when you do come, if you want, to, if, if you have, want someone to agree with you in prayer, we'll agree with you here this morning. Uh, also, uh, if you need healing, 
Come, come, you need deliverance? Come on, praise God. God's the deliverer. He delivers today. If there's a wall in your life and it just seems like I don't know what it's about, you know, you don't have to know the name of it or, or anything about it. It's just something in I don't know what it is. Let's just get rid of it. Amen. And we're going to pray. We'll take authority over that. God will set you free. So uh, I want you to come, come to the altar. Also, don't forget to pray for Ukraine and, and Russia. Russia needs prayers. Ukraine needs prayers. There's mothers crying in Russia because their children are dying in Ukraine. And uh, uh, they, they, they're not in favor of it. So the innocent people, there's a lot of guilty people, but there's the innocent people that we want to pray for. And let's also remember them and give an offering to them here later after the service. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, I come to you right now. I pray for all these, Lord, that you have spoken into that you have put in their heart. Lord, that, that, that gave them great joy at one time. And where the enemy has tried to come and to rob it. Uh, and to say it will never be. It will never happen. We cast down that lie in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we do not receive that pattern. We cast it off. So Lord, now in the name of Jesus, we just receive a, a, a fresh anointing. A fresh touch of you. Uh, uh, Lord, and, and uh, the, that word that you gave me, Lord, I receive it once again by faith. God, I ask you to touch them and renew it right now in the name of Jesus. Bring it to their remembrance right now as we're speaking, Father. We give you the praise for it. I ask you, Lord, to touch them now in Jesus' holy name. And we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. Hallowed be thy name, O Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen.